Chapter 3 Knights of the Blind My good friend, the late Father Thomas Carroll, once eloquently defined rehabilitation for the blind as the process, quote, whereby adults in varying states of helplessness, emotional disturbance, and dependency come to gain new understanding of themselves and their handicap, the new skills necessary for their new state of a new control of their emotions and their environment. This was precisely the concept I envisioned as I began trying to make my idea of a rehabilitation center in Arkansas a reality. Drawing on my experience in the field of rehabilitation, I felt the center should be an extension of the Vending Stand program, organized as a nonprofit organization rather than as a state agency. Because of my success with the Arkansas Employment Service for the Blind in establishing the STAND program, I believed the same principle could easily be applied to the new project. A private enterprise could operate with the efficiency of a well-run business while avoiding the excessive regulations and bureaucratic entanglements that seem to ensnare so many state agencies. I also like the private corporation concept because I knew there would not be enough blind people in Arkansas alone to justify the center, and by being a non-profit organization, the institution could supply services to blind clients from neighboring states as well. My final argument for the private approach involved the availability of training fees through the vocational rehabilitation provisions of the barden la Follette Act. In other words, the rehabilitation center I envisioned would function as a non-profit agency providing services paid for, in part, by fees from the state. To me, that concept reflected the best of all possible worlds. I already knew what a rehabilitation center could accomplish through the work of the U.S. Army's Old Farms Convalescent Hospital in Avon, Connecticut. Modeled on the post-World War I English facility, St. Dustin's Old Farms helped train American soldiers blinded in the Second World War. The term hospital was a misnomer since the services offered at Old Farms were closer to those of a training school for the blind. While I realized we could never duplicate the services of a federally sponsored program in Little Rock, I believed Old Farms did provide an important pioneering effort in organizing an adjustment center for the blind. Consequently, during the summer of 1946, I visited Avon to tour the facility I hoped would serve as a model for my proposed center in Arkansas. Housed in a boys' prep school in the beautiful Farmington River Valley, old farms reminded me of a gigantic English manor house with its rock walls and exposed ceiling beams. Under the command of Colonel Frederick Thorne, an ophthalmologist for the Army Medical Corps, the Avon Center stressed self-care and personal adjustment, physical exercise, social recreation, and various improvement courses like Braille, typing, and music. Through a lengthy testing process, the Old Farms staff also tried to identify vocational aptitudes and interests on the part of their blind patients. I spent two days at Avon under the tutelage of a counselor I had met earlier through the American Association of Workers for the Blind. One of the first things I noticed as we toured old farms was the strong emphasis the staff placed on mobility. For the first time in my life, I observed the work of an individual trained to teach a blind person the use of a cane as a mobility aid. My friend called these people's orienters and showed me how they took 
the blind soldiers around the campus grounds and taught them to use the cane in a rhythmic sweeping motion. The agility of many of these soldiers went far beyond anything I had witnessed in Arkansas. The staff also included Braille instructors, many of whom were blind themselves, and specialists who taught typing and other communication skills. My initial impression was that the employees outnumbered the trainees, which later proved to be true. The Avon facility had a better than one-to-one -one staff patient ratio. From my first moment at Avon, I recognized that we would never be able to duplicate in Arkansas the homogeneity of the trainers at old farms. All of these young men had served in the Army, all had been blinded suddenly by an accident, and all of them were young enough to have the faith their lives could still be productive despite their handicap. Since the war had only recently ended, numerous trainees were blinded prisoners of war from Japan. Several of these men had participated in the Grizzly Bataan Death March, and most of their blindness had resulted from malnutrition rather than shell explosions or other violent war wounds. For the first time, I realized that the lack of a proper diet could cause blindness. Years later, when I began helping the governments of developing nations inaugurate programs for their own blind, I drew upon this earlier experience and pointed out that many people in these emerging nations had been blinded by malnutrition and a new emphasis on diet might reduce the number of sightless individuals. A final thing that impressed me about old farms was that, as an army facility, all of its procedures rigidly followed military discipline. The staff forced all of the trainees to pass through a mess line at each meal exactly as they would have done in regular army. I thought it most inconsiderate to force these men to suffer the humiliation of trying to carry a tray full of food while they felt their way to a table. When I asked the director why the institution maintained that ridiculous policy, he shrugged and said, well, we're part of the Army, and you just can't get those regulations relaxed. Although I learned numerous valuable lessons about running a rehabilitation center from my trip to Avon, military compassion and military logic were not items I wanted to transplant to the new center in Arkansas. After my tour of the Avon facility, I made a brief excursion to New York City to visit an old friend in Manhattan. In the immediate post-war era, hotel rooms were difficult to find in New York, and the only accommodations I could locate cost $20, which was far more than I could afford. My friend told me not to worry about the room. He telephoned the headquarters of the American Foundation for the Blind, and the kind people there found me a comfortable room for only $5 a night. When I called Dr. Robert Irwin, the director of the foundation, to thank him, he graciously invited me to lunch. One of the early giants in the work for the blind, Robert Irwin, had been active in the formation of the AFB and had served as its director for many years. People in the field of rehabilitation usually mentioned Irwin's name with awe. We lunched at an exclusive private club near Park Avenue, and toward the end of the meal I began to tell Irwin about my trip to Avon and my plans for a rehabilitation center in Arkansas. Instead of the enthusiastic approval I expected, Irwin shocked me. Ah, uh, there's nothing to that, he signed. You're just starting another home for the blind. It's all been tried before. It won't work. I would probably have felt more comfortable if he had thrown a glass of water in my face. Well, Dr. Irwin, I responded, the project could never become a home because part of the financing would come from the Barton La Follette Act. Vocational rehabilitation would pay for pre-vocational training so we could only bring people into the residence who were on a rehabilitation plan 
and they would have to move out to a job before we could bring in someone else. Irwin insisted the idea would never succeed because a similar plan had been tried during the First World War and had failed. I saw little point in pursuing the argument, and even though I greatly admired Robert Irwin, I refused to be disheartened by his remarks, and I left New York still confident that in the near future I would find the way to build the first rehabilitation center for the civilian blind in Arkansas. When I returned to Little Rock, I began to organize the initial financing of the project. Because I wanted to expand the voluntary agency, I never considered asking for funding from the state legislature. Instead, I launched what I regarded as the key ingredient in my plan. I suggested my local Lions Club become a participant in establishing a regional adjustment center for the adult blind. I chose the Lions Club because of its long history of aiding the blind in various capacities. Founded in 1917, Lions International was the creation of a Chicago insurance executive named Melvin Jones. Before World War I, Jones had observed that both the Rotary Club and Kiwanis Club had grown from simple luncheon groups to genuine forces in the business world and he wanted to add the concepts of service to the business promotion aspect of the earlier clubs. Prior to the war, numerous independent luncheon clubs like the Businessman's Circle existed, and Jones organized a convention of these associations in Dallas in the fall of 1917. Lions International resulted from that meeting. The delegates derived the word lions from liberty, intelligence, our nation's safety, and they selected the motto, We Serve, to emphasize the role of community service. In each community, the members of the club joined by occupational classification. For example, a local club would include only one automobile dealer, one insurance man, or one tire store owner. Sometimes that policy produced some unusual results. I remember one instance in Little Rock where the club already included a Presbyterian minister when the superintendent of the Methodist Church, who had been an active lion in another town, moved to Little Rock. Since the club already had a Protestant preacher, some people felt there would be a conflict over admitting the superintendent. They finally solved the dilemma by designating one man as being in the wholesale ministry and one in the retail ministry. Starting in the late 1940s, the Lions Club grew rapidly and the classification system became less important. If a member felt any man would be a good addition to the club, he could sponsor that individual for membership regardless of occupation. Once admitted, a new lion had to attend the regular meetings. Most clubs' constitution contained a provision that if a member missed three consecutive meetings without a good excuse, he could be dropped from the membership rolls. The constitutions usually provided for substituting attendance at another Lions Club meeting, which aided businessmen who traveled a good deal. Almost from the beginning, the Lions Club major area of service centered on aiding the blind. For many years, I assumed this concern probably resulted from the fact that Melvin Jones had a blind sister or brother or someone else close to him, and because of that, he had steered the club into a strong role in the sight conservation movement. In 1943, I discovered the real reason for the club's commitment to the blind. While attending a rehabilitation conference in Chicago that year, I visited the Lions International headquarters. After being announced as a visitor, to my amazement, Melvin Jones himself breezed out of his office and volunteered to conduct a personal tour. As we walked through the facility, I asked Mr. Jones why lions were so involved in the work for the blind. 
The Secretary General explained that the organization's commitment in that area dated back to a Lions convention in Cedar Creek, Ohio, in 1925. At that meeting, Helen Keller had electrified the group by demonstrating her ability to communicate and explaining how she overcame her double handicap of blindness and deafness. At that time, Miss Keller was involved in a campaign to raise an endowment fund for the recently formed American Foundation for the Blind. So in her speech, she challenged the Lions to become Knights of the Blind. After her address, several motions from the floor demanded that the club adopt the work for the blind as a major function. The convention went on record as accepting Miss Keller's challenge and making sight conservation and aid to the blind the Lion Club's major service activity. After the Cedar Creek meeting, local Lions Club sponsored a variety of activities as Knights of the Blind, raising money for brailing, recording books and educational materials, purchasing typewriters, radios, and canes, underwriting cost of dog guides, buying glasses for needy children, and establishing eye clinics. With this background, the Lions Club seemed to be the logical organization to help establish an adjustment center for the blind. Consequently, I approached my local club about the project in August 1945. I had belonged to the Little Rock Lions Club since 1940, when I joined under the sponsorship of Hugo Norvell of the Share Norvell Tire Company. I felt honored to be invited to join the Little Rock Club, which is the oldest Lions Club in time of service in Lions International. That spring, I traveled to Fort Smith to attend my first state Lions convention, and thereafter became an enthusiastic supporter of the club and its activities. Over the next 40 years, I attended 18 international Lions conventions in places ranging from Nice, France, to Tokyo, Japan, along with numerous state and district conferences. I almost always wear my Lions pin, and even today I still feel a tingle of excitement when I think that there are over 33,000 Lions clubs in 151 nations with over 1.3 million members. My personal interest in the Lions Club actually began during my student days at the School for the Blind, when the club donated a Braille edition of the Reader's Digest to our school library. At that time, our library was little more than a depository of surplus textbooks, and I remember being excited to have access to some extracurricular reading material. Even today, I recall an article about truck farming in Alaska that appeared in that edition of the Digest. Being raised on a similar farm, I found the article fascinating and sincerely appreciated the Lions Club gift. In fact, the school authorities designated me to attend a club meeting to formally express the gratitude of all my students. The club met at the YMCA building at 6th and Broadway, and I remember being impressed by those business and professional men who not only helped those in need, but also seemed to have so much fun. They introduced me to the tail twister and other lion's jokes, and I left that meeting with high hopes that someday I might become a part of the Lions Fellowship and commitment to service. For many years after I became a member of the Little Rock Lions Club, I enjoyed the comradeship of the Wednesday noon luncheons and the Monday lunch meetings of the Major Activities Committee. Both luncheons met in the Old Marion Hotel and provided a unique combination of fellowship and service. Despite a sometimes excessive amount of boosterism in the Lions Club, the organization's dedication to helping the blind made my 40-year membership in the group a meaningful experience. Soon after I joined the club in 1940, 
our membership decided to sponsor a vending stand and agreed to loan the AESB $150. This process had been an earlier idea of mine and had become an integral element in financing the stand program, seeking an interest-free loan rather than an outright gift from the Lions and other service clubs and having the clubs execute the interest-free loan. My initial opportunity to involve the Lions in the center came in the summer of 1945 when our club's new president, Stanley Combs, appointed me chairman of the Site Conservation Committee. In that capacity, I called a committee meeting in my office in August to discuss various projects that would challenge our organization to become more involved in the work for the blind. My committee included Finnis Davis, the superintendent of the State School for the Blind, Dewey Thompson of the Arkansas Optical Company, Howard Cruz, a local banker, R.A. Cook, an automobile dealer and former county judge, and Hugo Norvell. Prior to this meeting, the Site Conservation Committee had been passive and had limited its activities to the occasional purchase of eyeglasses for the needy school children. I felt that since the Lions Club had accepted Helen Keller's challenge to become Knights of the Blind, the time had arrived for our committee to increase its responsibilities. At the August meeting, we considered two proposals. Mr. Davis suggested a sight-saving class in the public schools where partially sighted children could have access to large print books and receive instruction from specially trained teachers. I personally presented the second idea, although at the time I did not expect an enthusiastic response from my fellow committee members. I proposed the Little Rock Lions Club promote a statewide Lions Club effort to establish a readjustment center for the adult blind. I recognized my idea represented an ambitious undertaking, especially since the absolutely no precedent ex existed anywhere in the country for such a project. Much to my surprise, the idea caught Judge Cook's imagination. After my presentation, he addressed the meeting. I like this idea a lot, he said. In fact, I like it so much that if the Lions Club adopts the project, I will personally pledge $250 a year for the remainder of my life. Judge Cook's enthusiasm impressed Sandley Coombs, a new Lions Club president always wants to initiate an innovative project, and the ambitiousness of the proposed center appealed to Mr. Combs as well as Judge Cook. We debated the merits of the project through the afternoon, and finally, to my delight, the members of the Site Conservation Committee voted to recommend the establishment of the center as the club's major service activity. Of course, that recommendation had to be approved by both the Major Activities Committee and the Board of Directors before being offered to the membership. As chairman of the Site Conservation Committee, I personally presented the proposal to the Activities Committee the following month. Because the center required considerable commitment in terms of money and volunteer hours, I faced an inordinate amount of discussion, debate, and opposition. At each committee meeting, I encountered the same basic objectives. Someone always argued the project could not be done because it had never been done before. In the past, each local Lions Club had organized its own individual community projects, and no one had ever tried to create something that would be coordinated on a statewide basis. Some of our members felt the center should be limited to the Little Rock area under the sponsorship of the local club, while others wanted to continue buying eyeglasses and white canes. 
I spent many hours patiently explaining how the center would have to be statewide because no single community had a sufficient blind population to justify the operating costs. I also appealed to our members' competitive instincts. Why not be the first Lions Club to inaugurate a statewide project? Why not show clubs in other states what could be accomplished through the cooperation of local Lions Clubs? The second major objection centered around the ill feelings between the urban and rural areas of Arkansas. Several men contended that Lions Clubs outside the city would never contribute money to something in Little Rock. Traditionally, the rural areas resented the state's only metropolitan center, and this rivalry hovered over everything from high school football to state politics. Only a handful of men from Little Rock have been elected governor of Arkansas. I met this challenge by arguing that I had been all over the state for the past six years establishing the vending stand program, and in my travels I sensed a lessening of the urban-rural rivalry. I reasoned that all we needed to do was to convince the local clubs that a statewide facility would be the only way their local blind citizens could receive the needed services of a readjustment center. Of course, some members felt the project would be too expensive, that such a comprehensive program would be beyond the scope of the Lions Club project. I explained that while we would have to provide half of the operating budget, the fees paid by vocational rehabilitation would cover the other 50%. From the beginning, the center would be 50% self-supporting, and the Lions Club would never have to pay all of the center's expenses. I also explained that the proposed center should not be regarded as a luxury. The law entitled every blind person to rehabilitation services, and I challenged our members to establish a facility to provide that assistance. Over a several-week period, I sensed the opposition to the project, subsiding and a genuine enthusiasm for the center spreading among our local Lions. Late that fall, the board of directors of the clubs agreed to present a resolution to the state Lions Convention, and if the convention adopted the resolution, the Little Rock Club would raise the first $10,000 to lease a building, purchase equipment, and pay the utilities for the first year of operation. The following May, the State Lions Convention met at the Arlington Hotel in Arkansas's famous resort city of Hot Springs. Since Mr. Combs' term as club president was almost over, our new president, Finnis Davis, presented our resolution to the convention. Some months earlier, Finnis and I, under the direction of our local board, had met with Albert Demaris, an attorney, and prepared the actual formal statement with all of the necessary whereases and therefores. The convention schedule called for our resolution to be presented on the last day of the meeting, so several me members of the Little Rock Club, myself included, spent many hours informally discussing the proposed center with delegates from all over the state. We distributed copies of an article from a North Carolina newspaper about a similar program that had recently started in that state. The North Carolina people had acquired an old Navy facility and received legislative authorization to inaugurate what they called a pre-conditioning center. The convention delegates in Arkansas liked the article and seemed receptive to the idea of establishing a center in our state. I remember spending many hours on the hotel veranda discussing the proposed project with my fellow Lions from throughout Arkansas, and I recall my pleasure as I realized many of the delegates shared my excitement. One problem that concerned me was the election for district governor. In 1946, Arkansas had only two district governors, 
and the competition for one position that year was especially fierce between a preacher from Stuttgart and a utility company sales manager from Hot Springs. Backed by their respective clubs, both candidates campaigned hard, which placed the Little Rock Club in a dilemma. Since both candidates had many supporters, we did not want to offend one group or the other and possibly alienate them from supporting our resolution. We finally solved the problem by having the Little Rock delegates cast secret ballots and avoid public support of either candidate. Edward G. Barry, the utility executive, won the election, and his victory, although I did not realize it then, was to provide the Readjustment Center with one of its staunchest supporters for years to come. On the last day of the 1946 convention, Finnis Davis presented the resolution calling for the creation of a pre-vocational adjustment center for the adult blind. The statement recommended that the delegates adopt the center as a statewide project and then appoint a committee to conduct a study on how to coordinate the work of all the Lion Club, Lions Clubs throughout the state. Apparently, the members of the Little Rock Club had done their preliminary work well. The resolution passed with a minimum of discussion. I witnessed the proceedings of that meeting with a growing sense of pride and purpose. Those business leaders had taken a bold step in adopting the nation's first statewide Lions project, and I believe that they had established a foundation for making Arkansas a pioneer in the rehabilitation movement. Immediately after returning to Little Rock, our local club set out to raise the promised $10,000 for the building, equipment, and utilities. After several meetings, we decided not to conduct a public fundraising campaign. Rather, we chose to solicit the majority of our needed funds from the Little Rock business community. The main factor in this decision was the presence of what was then referred to as the RAT money. The RAT money originated during the war when the city's chief public health officer asked the Lions Club to sponsor a program to eradicate the problem of rodents in the city. The presence of the rats created a health hazard but the public health department lacked money to exterminate the creatures on a wide scale. Under the auspices of the Lions Club, city officials created a $10,000 revolving fund to hire trained crews to rat-proof restaurants, cafes, warehouses, and other properties where the rodents posed a problem. The property owners were more than willing to pay for the service because of the wartime difficulty in finding qualified people to perform this kind of work. The program succeeded to the point that when it ended, the revolving fund remained intact. While the members of the club debated what to do with the money, I tried to devise a plan to use the funds for the adjustment center. Before too long, I realized this idea would not work because a growing number of lions wanted to return everyone's money. They thought this gesture would build tremendous goodwill for the club, and to a large extent they were right. We surprised many local businessmen when a delegation of lions stopped by to refund their contribution. I remember some of them laughing and saying, Why in the world are you returning this money? I've already written it off, my taxes, as a contribution. Less than a year after the refunding of the RAT money, we launched our campaign to raise the $10,000 for the Adjustment Center. Since we solicited from many of the same people, the goodwill of the earlier campaign really did carry over, and these businessmen gladly contributed to our new project. Under the co-sponsorship of Charles Myers of Myers Bakery and George Tyre, Tyler of First Federal Savings and Loan, the campaign fulfilled all my hopes. Toward the end of the drive, we did make some public appeals, and I remember recording a series of brief speeches to be played on the radio. 
I regarded the whole experience not just as a fundraising campaign, but an opportunity to educate the public to the needs of blind people. The radio broadcasts taught me a lesson in the power of the mass media as an educational tool. For many years thereafter, I tried to utilize the radio and television to inform people of our activities at the center and maintain the public interest in our various programs. When we passed the $10,000 mark, I sensed a new era beginning in my own life. The efforts of the Lions Club to promote the new center extended my expectations, and I felt confident that under the guidance of the club, the new nonprofit organization concept would be able to grow and flourish. I also found exciting the enlarged opportunities for helping newly blinded adults on a regional basis. By the fall of 1946, my dream of a pre-vocational adjustment center appeared close to a reality. We had the concept, a dedicated organization, and the initial funding. The next step was to take this dream and crystallize its physical setting. To locate a place where blind people could come and begin their journey to a new life.